It doesn't really feel like we're being impeached. Do you? The yeas are 230, the nays are 197, present is one. Article one is adopted. Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at Post Live. I'm Karen Tumulty. I'm a columnist here at The Post. I write about politics, and it is my great pleasure this morning to be interviewing a couple of my colleagues and friends, Kevin Sullivan and Mary Jordan, about their brand new book, Trump on Trial, the investigation, impeachment, acquittal, and aftermath of, of that we have all lived through in this past year. And Kevin, that's one of the things that, you know, as I was reading this, this book, which is just, it, it, it's gripping, but I had to keep reminding myself that it has happened just in the last year. I think for a lot of us, 2020 feels like it's been a decade long. And so this fall, two months from now, we are going to be, um, we are going to be facing an election, which will be the first time ever that an impeached president appears on the ballot. So could you talk a little bit about the dynamics that were set into motion by this investigation, by the subsequent impeachment and the acquittal that are still playing out today as we, as we head toward, into this final stretch before the election? Well, thanks, Karen. I think I'll just start there. It, two big, big things. Uh, one, it's emboldened Donald Trump. He hates this. He's angry. He doesn't like the stain, and he wants to win. The very night the House voted to impeach, he flew to Michigan, and he got a big crowd, and he promised four more years. At the same time, another thing is it's jeopardized the Republican majority in the Senate. Uh, in key swing states, people were upset that, you know, they like to think the Senate, they're independent thinkers, a check on the presidency, and Sarah Gideon is using what, what uh, Susan Collins said and did in that voting not to uh, acquit. So you'll see that both it's been, you know, kind of a boon for Trump and some of his supporters saying we're going to win it back, but in the Senate there's some problems, especially uh, in these divided states. So could you remind people what it was that Susan Collins said in deciding to acquit the president, what she said was, oh, he, he'll be chastened by this. He'll essentially clean up his act. Uh, any evidence that he's done that? <laughs> Absolutely not. And uh, you know, I'm from Maine, so I'm, I've, I've been watching this race closely up there. And, you know, Sarah Gideon and a lot of political observers in Maine have, are making the case that Susan Collins is always concerned. She's always worried about something. And she always, she seems like she's giving a very, very thoughtful consideration to whatever the issue is, Kavanaugh or the Trump impeachment. And she always ends up coming down on the side of Trump. And I think that's a big part of Sarah Gideon's uh, campaign is that, you know, Susan Collins is, she may say she's a moderate, but she's actually very much in the Trump camp. And we document that in the book and we show how she, you know, how she was, she went through this whole process and ultimately came down right on Donald Trump's side. Well, another thing that, that I think has implications that go beyond the Trump presidency is that over and over again in this book, what you see is that career public servants are, are being vilified over and over again as some sort of hostile deep state. In the, you know, in the case of Lieutenant Colonel Benjamin, somebody who literally has bled for his country. What do you think the long-term implications of that are for the morale of public servants and also the willingness of, of people to take on these careers in the future? It's massive. It's absolutely massive. You know, during 
We have had a tr long tradition in this country of having civil service career professionals who are experts in, in foreign policy and health and taxation and whatever else it is. They don't make policy. The president makes policy. The administration makes policy, but he has to be able to rely on a well-informed, uh, experienced civil service to carry out whatever the presidential directives are. And we saw that over and over in the impeachment, Ambassador Yovanovitch in, in Ukraine and uh, Alexander Vindman in the White House and so many of these people who had such experience. There was one day when there was a there was a hearing and the two people testifying were, were Bill Taylor, who was the acting ambassador to Ukraine, and George Kent, who's a, a top State Department official. Between the two of them, they have almost 80 years of service to this country in the military and in diplomacy and in, in, in the State Department. And when they sat down, the Democrats thought, look at these two incredible witnesses we have. These are unimpeachable witnesses. And the Republicans, or at least many of them, looked at them and saw something to be suspicious of. These were people who were the deep state. These were people who were out to get the president without any evidence that that was ever true. They're, as we document in the book, these people were doing nothing but trying to serve their country. And we use both the Republican and Democratic testimony and yes. documents to show um, how the experts, right? I mean, these are experts in the State Department, in the intelligence service, people who have served for decades. Both parties just felt undermined. Uh, so I think that's a huge effect. Donald Trump Jr. tweeted at some point about these people. We need we need less of these jokers in 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 these positions. And you know, it's it's hard. And so many of them have been run out of the jobs. They've retired. They've been forced out. It's going to have a long term effect on morale. Well, before we delve a little more into some of the things you uncovered in your reporting, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your collaboration. I don't know if everyone who is watching realizes that you two have been married for 27 years, that you, for over half of your marriage, you have shared overseas bureaus for the Washington Post. And I believe you two are sitting in the very room where you wrote that book. Can you talk a little bit about what it's like to to take on a big project like this with your spouse. People ask us this all the time, and, and I tell them, and it's the honest to God truth, that we've worked together for so long that when I try to write something without Mary, it feels like I have one hand on the keyboard. I feel I feel like I'm 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 missing half my brain or something. And and we were overseas for almost 15 years, and I cannot count the number of times that Mary saved me from humiliating my oh, I was saying on. something really ridiculous in the print. I think it's one plus one equals seven. Um, it just kind of works. Uh, Kevin used to say Lennon and McCartney, um, and we're not saying humbly, it that humbly. humbly, yeah, as joking. But it, there is something about the mix. In this case, too, uh, we had we had to do it very quickly, and we had a powerhouse of collaboration. Uh, with the national staff, the national security staff, the White House staff of the Washington Post help with some reporting, our overseas staff, uh, and with Steve Luxemburg. Yeah, Luxenberg. we should also say that Steve Luxemburg, as a Post veteran, was involved with this process every step of the way. He made every page of this book better. We were really lucky to have such a terrific editor as a, as a collaborator and friend on this project. But it can be funny, though, when you edit each other's lines. I really don't like that one. You know. <laughs> Uh, he's a little more subtle when he doesn't like something than I am. But. <laughs> People say it all the time to Mary, how can you work with your husband? No one has ever once oh. said to me, how can you work with your wife? <laughs> oh, come on, I think come they on. see how that goes. <laughs> well, all of everything gets set into motion with a telephone call between the president and the new president of Ukraine uh, on July 25th, 2019. You, I mean, we, I think we all thought we knew everything there was to know about that call. The White House put out what it described as a transcript. It was just sort of loose notes. But one thing that you guys managed to, to get a hold of was what was happening on the other end of that call. So could you talk a little bit about that? And you know, what were the motivations in Washington and what were the motivations in Ukraine in, in even having this conversation? Well, one of the key things we're trying to do is, is create vivid scenes. Um, and we realized that while we knew that every, who was in the situation room listening to Donald Trump when he was on the phone in the private residence of the White House, we needed the other side. So uh, with reporting, we actually were able to piece together a half an hour before that call in a small room 
in the, on the fourth floor of the presidential mansion that overlooks this gorgeous cathedral thousands of miles away, uh, the aides of the president of Ukraine were passing him notes. And, and funny enough, they were saying things like, you know, the guy has a big ego, this Trump guy, you know, make sure you kind of boost him up. Somebody actually said, do you think we should say that we might have a Trump tower here? And then they said, no, no, maybe better not that. But for sure, talk about the swamp. He loves that word. And of course, you know, brand new president who is dependent on aid, critical military aid, you know, wants to get along with the new US president. It was really an illuminating scene. Um, an important one, I think, to add to the whole picture of, of what was going on and, and, a, and a vivid scene. And, and to, to motivation for the call, as you mentioned, Ukrainians desperately wanted Donald Trump to meet with, with Zelensky at the White House. They wanted that grip and grin at the White House, mainly so they could show it to Vladimir Putin and say, look, this shows that the relationship between the United States and Ukraine is solid. They, they are allies and they are allied against the, our military aggression in Ukraine. That's what the Ukrainians wanted. Now, Donald Trump had, had been given talking points from, from, from his people saying, you know, we should talk about Russian aggression. We should talk about standing tall with Ukraine. We should talk about fighting corruption in that country. And, and, and Vindman and some of the other people were literally holding their breath to see if he would go because, you know, Trump ad libs and we all know that and that's, that, that's his right. But he very quickly went, went off the rails and started talking about Joe Biden and CrowdStrike and some of these other some of these other things that were so uh, jarring to the Ukrainians. And when we when we did the reporting on the Ukrainian side, it was it was really funny because the Ukrainians were they were Googling CrowdStrike. What is CrowdStrike? They had no idea what he was talking about. Um, so they CrowdStrike wanted CrowdStrike being a, a company that that supposedly had access to the the DNC server and according to conspiracy theories had hidden it somewhere in Ukraine, yes. correct? It's a, long, it's a long, pretty nutty conspiracy theory, but- um, That Rudy Giuliani, um, you know, again, we're talking about undermining the experts. He was going around flying to, to Europe and elsewhere saying things like, you know, it's really not Russia that interfered, it's Ukraine. And then he would throw in CrowdStrike. And, and, and so it was, this call was kind of going off the rails and they had been used to that because Sometimes Donald Trump, when he'd hear the word Ukraine, he'd say, oh, Miss America pageant, Miss Universe pageant. So even while used to that, they were still surprised. And they, they still regarded it as a friendly call. They didn't get what they wanted, but they, they regarded it as a step forward. Um, and afterward, they all, they, someone brought in bowls of chocolate and vanilla ice cream because it was a very hot afternoon and they were, they were eating it, sort of celebrating. And then, then it occurred to them, wait, we got absolutely nothing out of that call that we wanted. All we got was sort of some talk about Joe Biden and CrowdStrike. Um, so they, their enthusiasm cooled very quickly with the ice cream. <laughs> well, and Zelensky and Trump have something in common that because Zelensky, before he was elected, was known primarily as a television celebrity, just like Donald Trump was. So you get almost the sense that these two guys kind of kind of get each other on on some level, don't you? They, they do. And during the call, Zelensky was very quick to say, Mr. President, we learned so many lessons from what you, you know, what you did in your election. We're trying to drain the swamp, too. We're trying to do and, and I think I think he meant it. I think he also understood that this was the way to get in Donald Trump's good graces was to was to butter him up. But I think he he, he did mean it. And he. A lot has been made about the fact that Zelensky never stood up and said, I was pressured by the by the president of the United States. He would be insane to say that. And he knows it because he's a performer. I mean, he, he needs his relationship with Trump. He needs his relationship with the United States. But we document all kinds of people right around and, and in Ukraine who, who said absolutely that he felt pressure. So. Absolutely. So another one of the really interesting characters in the book was Nancy Pelosi who at the outset of this says she's absolutely against impeachment. She actually uses the phrase with our colleague Joe Heim that Trump is not worth it. Essentially, this is, this is something that should be decided by the election. But the, the forces kind of build and in some ways almost take this decision out of her hands. Could, could you talk a little bit about that? A lot of the book is that because she is, after all, um, you know, she's a leader of this whole unruly group. Uh, some are far left, some are more centrist. 
and she was kind of taking the temperature all along. There is one stirring moment that I think because life is so fast paced, there's so much going on that it's worth revisiting. Uh, a Pelosi always looked to John Lewis, who was then alive and at one point stood in the house in one of his last times. We heard from him before he died. And a lot of people listened to John Lewis, who was such a icon for the civil rights movement. And he said, um, and Nancy Pelosi was listening as she was trying to figure out what to do. He said, people are coming up to me and they say that under this president, I feel we're descending into darkness. And he said, when I go to sleep at night, I worry when I wake up, our democracy won't be here. And I think at the time, it didn't really get as much um, attention because so much is going on. Uh, but she was listening to Lewis and she was listening to other people and eventually felt she had to go. And we document very, very vividly in the book, the Republican view of this, this whole thing too. I mean, from the beginning, the Republicans were saying, this is nothing but a democratic effort to undo the 2016 election. You've been trying to do this since the day Donald Trump was elected. This is a witch hunt and you know a scam and a scheme and you know, all the other words that we've, that we've heard. And Nancy Pelosi uh, heard that too. And she kept saying to her caucus, we have to make sure that this isn't a one-sided um, uh, impeachment, that this has to be bipartisan, that we need something that we need, we need a crime basically that, that is, that everyone can understand. It's easy for the public to understand and that some, at least some of our Republican colleagues will also join us with. And early on, some of the things that were, were happening, she didn't think that they rose to that level. Then the phone call happened and we had a whistleblower complaint that laid out what, what was said on that call. And you can, we document in the book, her evolution. She heard that more and more people in her caucus were starting to, were starting to call for impeachment. And she finally, uh, on September 24th, just decided that she had, she had a responsibility. She had a duty to go for it. And, you know, a lot of the Republicans we spoke with, um, you know, said, I don't like what Donald Trump, but, you know, let the voters decide. And that's, again, why people are saying that it's important to look at this. But the whole point was, OK, be informed, know everything that's happened as we head to the polls, uh, because there were Republicans who at least privately were upset um, about what he was doing, but just didn't feel that they should throw him out of office, especially when we were this close to an election. That's why we feel this book is so relevant to the election. It's not a it's not a history book about impeachment. It's about what's it's about the factors that are going into this election now. And the case for and against Trump are laid out and voters can read it and decide for themselves. I mean, people were saying all along, let's let, let the voters decide and here's our chance in November. Well, that's but you know, they at the beginning they think they might be able to pull pull a couple of Republicans off here and there. Yeah. But it, it becomes clear to them that that just isn't going to happen. I, I think it probably becomes clear at that wonderful moment that you write about where Will Hurd, the congressman from Texas on the Intelligence Committee, who everyone thought was most likely to defect, gets up and announces, no, this does not rise to impeachment. I mean, was that the moment where it sort of the, the die was cast and the Republican Party decides, with the exception of Mitt Romney in the Senate, decides they are all on board with the president? That was a key moment. And we have great reporting in there from Will Hurd, who I think at some point was getting annoyed with the fact that everyone understood that he was a centrist and everyone understood that he wasn't just a knee jerk supporter of Donald Trump. He had written an op-ed in the New York Times criticizing Trump's policy toward Russia. So he was someone in the middle. The, but the more he looked at the impeachment evidence, the more he decided that it didn't rise to the level. But every day he would show up on these media lists of Republicans who might flip. And I think he just he, he was getting more and more frustrated with the fact that he was being called that. So on the, I forget the date, but at one of the hearings, he rather than use his time to ask questions of the witness, he used his time, his five minutes to make a really stirring speech where he said, this doesn't rise. This is bumbled foreign policy. This is ridiculous. I mean, this is this is inept handling of our foreign policy, but I don't see a crime here that the president should be impeached for. So, yeah, that was a pretty key moment because I think there was a lot of a lot of Democrats were deflated that if they couldn't flip Will Hurd, who were they going to flip? Well, we have a question here from one member of our audience, um, Sandra Stevenson from Maryland, 
who wants to know what was your biggest surprise when you were writing and reporting this book? I think we lay out exactly how uh, Trump uses pro-Trump media. For instance, a five-year-old network that most people hadn't heard of. I mean, it, it's you know one American news network. Um, they, you know, he puts Giuliani or encourages Giuliani to go on. He gets a clip that talks about some conspiracy theory about Ukraine. And then there it goes, Don Jr. tweets it, and then he tweets it, and all of a sudden it is all over the news. And with 85 million Twitter followers, Donald Trump is famous for boasting that he's bigger than any media company. He's his own media company and a powerful one. But how it's seeded, I think we were surprised at how uniform uh, in lockstep it often is and how quickly I mean, Trump has said, OK, I'm going to do this. Let's see how long it takes to get on all the network news. It was pretty uh, eye opening to us. We lay out in great detail one, one example of this on last March 20th. Uh, Hill TV, which has a few thousand followers, put up a report that was basically sourced from uh, a prosecutor in Ukraine who was really discredited, not, not someone who the United States regarded as you know, maybe involved in corruption, certainly not reliable. And he said that the U.S. ambassador, Marie Ivanovich, was corrupt, which there, there wasn't, wasn't then, and there still is zero evidence that, that she is in any way corrupt. Um, but that goes up at 11 o'clock. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Sean Hannity has it on his radio show, which has 14 million listeners a week. By that evening, um, Hannity has it on his television show, which is one of the most powerful media outlets in the planet. And right after that, Donald Trump tweets the headline from this kind of relatively obscure Hill TV story in the morning. And the next morning, Trump himself tells John Bolton to fire Yovanovitch, who had done nothing wrong. So from 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 a little a spark of, of basically nothing to the president's, you know, order desk uh, was less than 24 hours. And it was remarkable to watch. And in many ways, it's this book is an X-ray of the president's playbook and how he operates. And, you know, by using documenting testimony and documents, again, both Republican and Democrats that were used in impeachment, here's a way to show, because the methods and things that were going on here, you know, dismissing the experts, you know, having um, kind of rogue characters like Giuliani, using uh, pro-Trump media, this, you know, this is not the, a one-time off thing about for Donald Trump. So. You know, I think that we think there's great value in kind of using it to really, really up close analyze the Trump playbook. Well, that's the other thing about this this Hill TV report. Um, ultimately, Hill TV doesn't quite write a retraction of this, but they acknowledge that that their reporting methods were improper, that they should have identified the journalist who did it as an opinion journalist, not somebody who was just a straightforward news guy. But by then, it's not that the horse is out of the barn, it's like a herd of horses is out of the barn. I mean, they've, they've already achieved with this journalistically suspect report what they wanted to achieve, isn't that correct? Yes, and, and also the messaging. Um, one of the things that that uh, Donald Trump and we we document how the the Democrats were really kind of we gotta match the amazing messaging machine out of the White House. They are simple. It's a hoax. It's a witch hunt. You know, get out early. Call it collusion. Set the story, even if it's not correct. Just set the tone. Make it simple. And the Democrats, time and time again have proven to make it a little more complicated, a little harder to understand and a and lot less unified because you have the left of the party, the centrists, and it is more of a, a noisy group. And they were trying, uh, like there were meetings that we document about saying, okay, the White House is gonna be unified and simple. How are we gonna counter that? Well, you know, in the few minutes that, that we have left. I think I would like to go to a point that you raise in the final few pages of the book and that I 
I found in some ways the most haunting of all. You know, impeachment, as you write, Alexander Hamilton envisioned it as something that would happen very, very rarely. But we have seen it happen now twice in just a little over 20 years. And in both cases, it played out exactly the same. A house that is controlled by the president's opposition impeaches him, and then essentially his neck gets saved by his own partisans in the Senate. And so you raise the question of, are we almost cheapening what should be a very, very rare occurrence in our system? Has, has impeachment become too easy? And is this essentially going to be what the future looks like? Well, that's a great question. And, you know, the impeachment is one of the major systems of in, the, in our system of checks and balances. It's one of the major mechanisms for Congress to hold the president accountable. And in some, it, it, it now appears that it's really more of a protest howl than, than any way to actually remove a president from office. Because anytime you have a president who has a friendly majority in the House, I mean, I mean a, an opposition majority in the House, they risk impeachment. But if they know that they have a friendly majority in the Senate, and remember, neither party has had a two thirds majority in the Senate, which is what is required to impeach, to remove someone from office. Nobody's had that for 80 years, and it's not going to change anytime soon. So Donald Trump was impeached in the House, which he could, you could see that coming, and then he was acquitted in the Senate. And he, we think what it appears, it appears that Trump has sort of learned that this has emboldened him. This has allowed him to say, I can do pretty much anything I want. Now, Senate Republicans obviously would argue with that if he committed some crime that, that they presumably would, would impeach him. But it does seem like we have set this up to, to, to weaken the balance of powers between the branches of, of, of government. Uh, and impeachment isn't exactly the tool that the founders envisioned that it would be. And it's one of the key reasons uh, you'll hear Democrats say that if Donald Trump is reelected, um, he'll do anything because we don't we're not going to have even if they retake the Senate two thirds, what you need in the Senate in these partisan times. What I mean, what is the control on him? And you'll be hearing that argument and, and other people say, um, you know, in these partisan times, that incredible down the line partisan vote, you know, with, with Republicans in the House just sticking with Trump, that because our times are so divided and so partisan, um, what long ago the founders may have envisioned that people would vote their conscience if they thought uh, that the president had stepped over the line. And look what happened to Mitt Romney. I mean, he was the only Republican in the Senate who stood up and said, I don't like what I see here. I do think it rises to the level of an impeachable offense. And he wasn't even invited to the convention. I mean, he's, he's for all, he's been basically shut out of the Republican Party since. And it's, I mean, it's it's sad to see that happening in our system. People and, should be able to vote their conscience. And back to John Lewis's worry about democracy. You know, a check on an all-powerful presidency is what America's about. You know, we don't want a dictator. And this uh, impeachment was a check. And like hearing what you're saying is that people are really worried we don't have that check in these days. And so, you know, that is why you hear so many people saying what has happened to our democracy as we know it. So what do you think Trump's legacy is going to be, that he was impeached or that he was acquitted? Well, uh, you know, as the Democrats kept saying, impeached for life. I mean, it, it is an asterisk. I mean, Bill Clinton, all these years later, was impeached. Trump will always be, uh, he, he cannot escape the label, impeached. Now, is, the, is that his legacy or is his legacy that he then came back and won an incredible re-election despite all this? Um, you know, it's 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 too soon. It's too soon to know. I think. I do think that November will know what the legacy is. Well, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. But thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mary. And congratulations on this absolutely terrific book. Um, please be sure to check out their new book, Trump on Trial: The Investigation, Impeachment, Acquittal, and Aftermath. I'm Karen Tumulty, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thanks all for listening.